So what is the work of preparation? We must receive Christ our righteousness, sons and daughters of God. Page 259, it says, one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. And what is that interest? What is that subject? Christ our righteousness. Go with me. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Where are we going to, my friends? Deuteronomy chapter 8. Write this down. Gospel workers, page 148. Ministers must present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied in connection with them the words, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Must we get victory over sin, my friends? Now get your volume 5. I'm going to put this in a second gear. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God's word says in verse number 2. Watch carefully. And this scripture is mentioning that we must study our history. What must we study, my friends? Write this quotation down. Life sketches. Life sketches. Page 196. It says, we have nothing to fear for the future except that we shall forget how God has led us and his teachings in our past history. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Are we there? Verse number one, it says, All the commandments which I command thee this day, shall you observe to do that you may live? And I'll bring you into the promised land. Verse two, and thou shalt remember, what's that word again, my friends? And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee how many years? In the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. To know what was in thine heart. Now, a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I began right here a Thursday evening, a Bible study. And then I continued on the next Sabbath morning's message. And I addressed the fall of two institutions within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Now, who remembers what those two institutions were? Who remembers what they were? And they were all destroyed by fire. What were they, my friends? Get to my screen. What were they, my friends? Amen. It was fire at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And number two, fire that destroyed the publishing work, the Review and Herald. And of course, in that study, we spoke about that they represent 9-11 for us. Let's move on. That's a, we cover that. There it is, February 18, 1902. That is a sanitarium. All right. And then we come December 30th, 1902. The publishing work, the Review and Herald. This evening, I want to address the educational work within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All right, my friends. Put this down. Get your pencils. Get your writing instruments. I want everyone to write down this name. The name is Battle Creek College. What is it, my friends? There it is. It's Battle Creek College. And Battle Creek College was the foundational institution for the educational work within the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Battle Creek College was the cradle of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. However, Battle Creek College it suffered a moral and a spiritual downfall. Look with me. Proverbs chapter 1. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs chapter 1. And look with me. Verse number 7. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the what now? What is the fear of the Lord, my friends? The fear of the Lord is to hate what? Come on. It is the beginning of knowledge. Does that make sense? Now watch. Hold your place in Proverbs. Go to Job 28 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Job 28. What school's name did you just write down? I gave it to you. What is it, my friends? It's Batter Creek College. Job 28. It was the cradle for Seventh-day Adventist educational work. But what did it suffer? 
It suffered, my friends, a spiritual moral fall. Battery Creek College had to close. And why? Because of the, of the bevy, the plethora of apostasies that were rife and prevalent in Battery Creek College. And what we shall see, the way our Satan worked to cause the downfall of Battery Creek College between 1881, put that date down, between 1881 through 1883 is the same way Satan is working in these last days to cramp, to trample upon, to stymie, to hinder the work of revival and reformation among Seventh-day Adventists, the same way Satan is working in these last days to cause God's people in these last days not to be able to fulfill the principles laid out in the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, not through verse 12, verse 6 to verse 16, the second coming of Christ. Watch carefully. Job 28, are we there, my friends? Look with me at verse 28. I want to show you something. Verse 28 says, are we there? It says, and unto men, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord what are your next three words? That is wisdom. So what is wisdom, my friends? What is education? Would you agree with me? The word wisdom and education can be used synonymously. Amen? So what is wisdom? Not what leads to wisdom. What is wisdom? It says the fear of the Lord is wisdom. I want to ask, what does the fear of the Lord mean? Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of Proverbs chapter 8, verse 11, verse 13, verse 14. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the forward mouth, the evil words. Do I hate? Notice now, Bible says now, the fear of the Lord. So when you shun iniquity, and shun sin, you receive true education. Does it make sense? But to hold on to sin, it shows you don't have God's wisdom. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Verse 28, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Let's read now. And to depart from evil is understanding. So what is understanding? Based on this, based on this text, talk to me. It is to depart from evil. What is synonymous to evil? Sin. What is sin? The transgression of God's law. So would you agree with the Bible then? That by following, obeying, adhering to God's Ten Commandments, this is how you know you have understanding? This is how you know you have wisdom? That this is how you know that you have true education? If that's clear, my friends. Say amen. Now notice, Battle Creek College, as you can see right here, between 1881 through what year I gave you? Talk to me. Through 1883, it closed, shut down, a moral, spiritual fall. Now note this. If the education is corrupt, then the ministers are corrupt, and the students are corrupt, and the parents are corrupt, and the homes become corrupt. And the churches become corrupt. If that makes sense, say amen. And that's why education, true education, forms the foundation. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Now watch the point. Go with me to Hosea. Hosea chapter 4. Where are we going to, my friends? Hosea chapter 4. And notice what this says in verse 6. It says, my people, why are they destroyed? It says, my people... Are destroyed for what, my friends? For a lack of knowledge. Put this scripture down. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13. God's word says, And all thy children, if you know it, finish it. And all thy children shall be what, my friends? Shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children, the peace of thy people. So now, if they don't receive godly education, true education, can they have peace? And who is peace? 
It's Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. How many of us right now desire true education? Raise your hand, my friends. Now watch the point as we begin to dig into the history of Battle Creek College between 1881 through 1883. We want to see their mistakes so we can correct those mistakes so that we can fulfill, oh, here it is, fulfill the words from education. Put this down, education. Page 271, which says, With such an army of workers as are a youth rightly trained, how soon would the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior be carried to the world? How soon might the end come? The end of suffering, the end of sorrow, the end of sin. Amen. Notice now, my friends, let's get into this. There was a general conference president in this time period, and his name was George Ida Butler. Put that name down, please. Or G.I. Initials, George I. Butler. We must know our history, my friend. What do you say? All right, get to my screen. Here it is. Watch carefully. Batter Creek College. Who knows what is the modern name for Batter Creek College today? It's on the screen. I'll wait on you. What's that name, my friends? Batter Creek College is presently called Andrews University. Right there on your screen. All right. And who was the founder of Battle Creek College, years after, renamed Andrews University. On the screen, who? No. Good try. Amen. It was Goodlow, Harper, Bell. Initial, J.H. Bell. It's right there on the screen. All right, move on. And here we have it now from the website of Andrews University. The name was firstly... Battle Creek College. Friends, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist in God's remnant movement, know your, thank you, so, know your history. Battle Creek College, blue words on the screen. It was renamed Emmanuel Missionary College. But by the year 1959 and beyond, it was renamed as what? Andrews University. Even to the present. Get to my screen. Hear what this says now. It says the action to close Batter Creek College, taken by its controlling board in the summer of what year? Note it. In the summer of what year? 1882 signaled a crisis of considerable proportions in the ranks of Seventh day Adventists. And here comes George I. Butler. Second paragraph. Blue words, won't spend much time. It says, we, no, let's read that. When the matter of opening the college, the present year of 1882, came before the board for consideration, we were thrown into great perplexity. We could see little ground of hope. <laughs> Watch carefully. And don't forget this phrase, prisoners of hope. Get back to my blue words. We could see little ground of hope for such a school as the Lord had shown we ought to have. Let's read those red words together. What it says, my friend, while the present state of things existed. Now, what were those present state of things? Watch carefully. Next paragraph from the biographical sketch, volume three. The first one was page 187, next paragraph, the testimony. Now watch, get your book, volume 5. I want to give you some context here. This study will focus on the first 120 pages of volume 5. Let's get some context. It says, get to my screen. It says, watch carefully, the testimony written from Boulder, Colorado, of course, on September 25th, what year? 1881, which Ellen White intended should be presented at the Michigan camp meeting, was finally read months after.
before the general conference session in December 1881. What happened there? Look at, my, look at page 9 of your volume 5. It actually begins with the words, Boulder, Colorado, and the date 1881. Then it says, Dear brethren and sisters, key word, who, who shall assemble at the Michigan camp meeting? What happened? The leaders in Battle Creek, men like Uriah Smith and others, the leading men in Battle Creek College, the leading men in Battle Creek, they received the letter from Ellen White but refused to read that letter at that camp meeting in Michigan. Get back to my screen. It says, also read at that time at the GC session to a smaller group, including workers in the Review and Herald office, the sanitarium, and Batcher Creek College, together with some of the delegates meeting in College Hall, was the 15-page testimony entitled what, my friends? Our college. Now, I'm going to run over here. Take your volume 5 and go to page 21. Our college. There is an asterisk there which says it was read at that very same place. Notice now, back to my screen. It says this solemn message opens with the words, there is danger that our college will be turned away from what, my friends? From its original design. But for one or two years past, there has been an effort to do what? Talk to me. To mold our school after other colleges. I wonder, do you see why the leaders in Battle Creek refused to read this letter that Ellen White sent to be read at the Michigan camp meeting in 1881? I wonder why. Why? Because they were rebuked for their apostasies and what chief error and sin was highlighted in this paragraph. They were trying to mold back to Creek College after what, my friends? Oh, beloved. Now watch carefully. So who were the leaders at this time? It says, uh, watch carefully. Why were, watch carefully. It was George I. Butler, Blue Words, Uriah Smith, and other leaders who were rebuked for their worldliness and for following their own inclinations as leaders in Battle Creek College and in Battle Creek Church. So they disregarded the counsels from Sister White. Elder Smith finally read the testimonies sent by Sister White to the church after being what? Talk to me. After being troubled by the Holy Spirit through Sister White's second letter, which she sent afterwards, and that letter was entitled what, my friends, in red words on your screen? The testimony is uh, slighted. Listen to what Sister White says on page 62 of volume 5, uh, first paragraph. In 1882, she says, Dear brethren and sisters in Batter Creek, I understand <laughs> that the testimony which I sent to Brother Blank, that's Uriah Smith, with the request that it be read to the church, was withheld from you for several weeks after it was received also by George I. Butler. Does that make sense, my friends? Now watch. Who else were in Battle Creek that were carrying on the apostasies? leading Battle Creek College, the cradle of education, of this movement, to favor and look at the world. It was John Harvey Kellogg on the screen. W.C. Gage. Now, don't forget this name. C.W. Stone from top. Listen to what Sister White says. This is pamphlet 117, page 70, paragraph 3. And this was written in what year at the bottom of your screen? What year? 1882, it says, the curse, this is Sister White speaking to the church leaders. She says, the curse which fell upon the fig tree because it bore no fruit, 
no threatens to fall upon. Which church? At Battle Creek, my friends. So what was she liking? Or likening the SDA church as in 1882? The fig tree. Get back to my screen. Red words at the bottom. It says they have been cautioned and reproved. But they have at times been far more ready to yield to the worldly influence than what, my friends? Than to yield to whom? Notice here, my friends. Notice. And also, not only Kellogg. And uh, Mr. Stone and Mr. Gage and Butler and U.S. Smith, who were also guilty in Batter Creek College, leading that school towards the world. A man called Sidney, Sidney Brownsberger and Mr. A. McLearn. Get to my screen. It says, watch carefully. Red words from top. A change in the administration at the college that thrust Dr. A. McLearn to the front greatly hastened the what, my friends? The degenerating trend of which school? Batter Creek College, now called Andrews University. Notice, at this junction, you have those men. Then it says, watch carefully now. At this junction, I must point to you the history of Elder Sidney. Brownsberger, who was a prior president before Mr. McLearn. Brownsberger, he began the downward trend by compromising and lowering the standards of Battle Creek College. He was rival to which person? Goodloe Harper Bell, the founder. Professor Bell was the founder and father of Battle Creek College in that year. Battle Creek College evolved from a private school began by Goodloe Harper Bell. Professor Bell set God's standards in Battle Creek College through what council? Whose council? Notice, Sister White, notice now, but the school board members chose whom? Don't forget that, Sydney. Sydney Brownsberger as the president. Why? Because he had... Uh, Degrees, letters, accolades, and good law bell had none. And under whom did that trend of degeneration begin? Under Sidney Brownsberger. And then afterwards, under whom? Professor McLearn. Don't forget that, my friends. Notice now, let's look at McLearn. McLearn, it says, McLearn was placed at the head of Battle Creek College in July 1881. And school began in the autumn. The move was a hasty one. The result of the resignation for health reasons of Sidney, Sidney Brownsberger, McLearn. Let's read those words. Come on together. Blue words. McLearn only recently had been baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. What happened there, my friends? They allowed a recently baptized person to stand where? To oversee what? <laughs> Batter Creek College. Last week we looked at hindrance to revival and reformation. And what was number two of 15 points on the screen? Electing, ordaining, apostate leaders unsanctified, ig ignorant, novices, immature leaders to become Seventh-day Adventist administrators. Friends, please go back and read those quotations. It's on the screen right there. Fifteen reasons, hindrances to revival and reformation. Get back here. Blue words. It says, now, McLearn, why was he chosen? He was highly educated. Along what, my friends? Along conventional lines. Holding what? The degree of doctor of divinity. So you would think having a doctor of divinity degree that he should have been suitable, right? Right, my friends? And yet we have men today hmm, parading their doctorate degree. I'm um, doctor so-and-so. Doctor so-and-so. 
Dr. So-and-so, but based on history, it was the doctors of the law that crucified Jesus. The Dr. Sidney Brownsberger in apostasy. Dr. McLearn in apostasy that caused Baxter Creek College to close a spiritual, moral downfall. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. I wonder if Christ had a doctorate degree. Oh, yes, he did. He was called the great physician. And what is the third point that hinders revival and reformation? It says here, my friends, the SDA leaders are operating the church primarily like a what? Like a business. So no, they don't choose the person that shows fruit of conversion. No, they, cho they choose the person with the degrees. They accolade. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Read those quotations on the screen. Get back to my quotation here. Red words, McLearn, it says, but he, McLearn, had no acquaintance with either the history of the Seventh-day Adventists or the philosophy of their educational work. So was he fit to become president, principal, headmaster of Batter Creek College? Was he fit, my friend? Why do you say no based on that one line? Why, my friend? Come on, come on, talk to me. Why? He did not know the history of our movement. He did not acquaint himself with the writings of Ellen White regarding true education. And yet, today, do we, do we not have men being placed as principals, as teachers, who have rejected the writings of Ellen White? So what will happen to also these institutions? Just like Batter Creek College. Oh, my friends. There it is. Number nine. 15 points. Why revival and reformation are hindered. SDA. Conference leaders allow young and old ministers who have rejected sister white writings to have influence in the churches and in the institutions. And you can read those quotes, my friends. We covered that last week. Won't spend much time there. Back to McLaren. Red words. It says, this new man had become known to church leaders back in early June on a Sabbath morning at the Spring Arbor Camp Meeting. Unwisely for himself and the cause, he was placed in such a position in less than how many months? Mercy. He's a babe. He needs to be drinking milk. The sister might not say, once you reach two or three months, then strong meat. He's a babe. And yet they allowed him to become overseer at Batter Creek College. Let's read on. It is sad to note that McLaren left the church in the summer of 1882 and joined another denomination. He began writing and criticizing the Seventh-day Adventist church. Let's move on. And then it says here, this is now Sister White confirming what the biographical sketch said on page 188. Here it is now, pamphlet 117, page 77, paragraph 3. And this was written in 1882, first sentence. She mentions, Mr. McLaren. All right. Red words. She says uh, he was placed in a difficult position. And who does Sister White blame for McLaren failing? Batcher Creek College closing. Mr. McLaren leaving the present truth. Who did she blame? She blamed the church. Red words in the middle. Last sentence, he has been sacrificed by both parties in the church. Blue words, she says, Mr. McLaren had newly come to the faith and was not prepared for what? The developments which have been made. 
Then she says, oh, my friends, you could read the rest of that. Had the church he did, the councils of God's spirit, had they individually, in the, individual, she says, had the church heeded the counsels of God's spirit, had they what? Individually. Individually, yes. Set about the work of reform instead of what? Vindicating themselves. Uh, tongue twister, move on. Then she says, but they have been rent asunder. This is Mel and McLaren blue words. They have been rent asunder. Have you never had a tongue tied before? Yeah. Let's get back here. But they have been rent asunder by a church which was blinded by the adversary of souls. Let's read that. Upon which the rebuke of God is what, my friends? So upon whom was God's rebuke resting? The church, my friends. I wonder why they did not allow the counsels Sister White laid out on how to choose administrators, professors, teachers to be followed. They walked after the kindling of their own desires. And what happened to Batter Creek College? Closed down. McLaren left the faith. How many souls, she says, were lost as a result? Again, Batter Creek College was the modern school for which school today? You wait until I get to Andrews. Get back here. Volume 5, uh, page 21. Skip on down to the bottom. It says, uh, this solemn message from volume 521 opens, watch carefully, opens with the words on page 9 through verse 21. There is danger that what? Talk to me. Our college will be turned away from its original design. But for one or two years past, there has been an effort to mold our school after other colleges. Now, friends, I want to see now. Let us study what were the original design that God laid out for the educational structure of Seventh-day Adventism. Number one, put on your paper the primary objective of the educational institution within Seventh-day Adventists. It is, number one, to restore the moral image of God in man that man can be now. Declared perfect by Jesus Christ. Is that clear, my friends? On the screen, objective of Seventh-day Adventist schools. What's number one, my friends? Restore the image of God in man that he may be what? Declared perfect by whom? Notice here, my friends, education. Page 15 says, to restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to what? You're not talking to me. Come on, it's right there. To restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to what? Talk to me. Perfection. In which he was created to promote the development of body, mind, and soul. Health reform, dress reform. That the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. Let's read. This was to be. The work of redemption. This is the object of education. The great object of life. Talk to me. As we compare the red phrase, red words, the phrase, and the last sentence on your screen. What is education then? It's, it, it is the work of redemption. Now. Since it is the work of redemption, would you allow a newly baptized person two months in the faith to become the principal of your school? <laughs> Talk to me. Would you allow a newly baptized person two months in the faith to become your pastor? But what if he has a doctorate degree? Come on. Get to my screen. Objective of Seventh-day Adventist schools. But what's going on today? Number two. It says uh, the study of scripture should what, my friends? Be paramount. 
have its first place in our schools. Get to my screen. Volume 521, there is danger that our school, Battle Creek, will be turned from its original design. God's purpose has been made known that our people should have an opportunity to study the sciences and at the same time to learn the requirements of his word. Let's read now. Biblical lectures should be given. The study of the scriptures should have the first place in our system of education. But what's going on today, my friends? What is, uh, what is the rival to this true system of education? The rival is when the leading men in Batter Creek College, his name was um, Sidney Brownsberger, and also uh, Dr. McLearn. Since they were doctors from the conventional schools, well, they brought the conventional worldly wisdom and curriculum from the world into where? Into Batter Creek College. And now they introduce the humanities, the literature, the classics, the classicals. Oh, yes, my friends, Greek, lit Greek literature, Roman literature, all these things. And the Bible began to be suppressed while man's wisdom was now elevated. And as a result, Batter Creek College received a moral fall. People lost their salvation in less than three years. It's worse today, my friends. Listen what this says. It says, watch carefully, volume 8 through 8, in the education of children and youth, fairy tales, myths, and fictitious stories are now given a large place. Books of this character are used in the schools and found where? They are filled with falsehood. I'm skipping around here. It says, uh, when the children ask the meaning of stories so contrary to the teaching of their parents, the answer is uh, that the stories are not true, but this does not do away with the evil results of their use. The widespread use of such books at this time is one. It's one of the cunning devices of Satan. The devil is seeking to divert the minds of old and young from what, my friends? The great work of preparation for the things that are coming upon the earth. Never. What does never mean? Never should books containing a perversion of truth be placed before children or youth. And if those with mature minds had nothing to do with such books, they would be far safer. A few months ago, I should, while at Oakwood, I was confronted with the Greek literatures. And friends, I despised them. And I fasted, and I prayed, and I went to the, uh, the cheer of the English department and spoke, and of course, with him. And God gave me victory from that. And if God did it for one, he can do it for you. And if you go, watch carefully now, and as you mold our schools to pattern the worldly schools, you must build libraries. And what must you put in those libraries? The books from the infidel, pagan authors. So what are the young people, their minds exposed to? God's word or man's words? What are they eating from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which caused Eve and Adam to sin and sin perpetuated. By choice, we are here, my friends. But what must we be drinking from? And if you notice, if you go to our colleges, think about this. Two of the primary identifying marks of Seventh-day Adventists, the 12th chapter of the Revelation, verse number 17, they keep what? The commandments of God and what else they have? The testimony of 
Jesus Christ. And what is that? The spirit of prophecy. Now, let us be honest and compare how much time is spent on reading the spirit of prophecy with reading infidel authors, worldly wise men and their books. How much time in Oakwood, Andrews, Walla Walla, La Sierra, PUC, Union College, Andrews. How much time for all students, not only for some, but for all students. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. Notice. Watch, and we are told, once the ministers who go to our schools and are not taught the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are not paramount in those schools, well, those young ministers leave the colleges, go, go on, many oversee churches, all right, and those ministers, they are ignorant regarding present truth. Hear me now. Many of the common persons in the pews are studying diligently the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So who knows more of God's word? These young ministers leaving Andrews, Oakwood, Southern, or the people in the pews who are studying the Bible. Volume 5, Great Controversy, Ministry of Healing, the nine volumes of the testimonies. Who know more, my friends? The people in the pews. Look at this statement. Volume 2, page 499. Paragraph 2, those who minister in the word must have a thorough, must have as thorough a knowledge of that word as it is possible for them to obtain. They must be what talk to me, continually searching, praying, and learning, or the people of God will advance in the knowledge of his word and will and leave these professed teachers. We're mercy. Lord have mercy upon their souls. Next sentence. Behind it says, who will instruct? The people, when the people are in advance of their teachers. All the efforts of such ministers are what, my friends, are fruitless. Pause right there. And this is one reason why many ministers, they call their members offshoots and fanatics. Do you see why now? Because those pastors are, igno are willfully ignorant of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But some members are studying. And as they begin to proclaim, live and teach others, the pastors and the elders marginalize them. Even, <laughs> I won't go there. Also, they call them all shoots. Now you can see why. It says, uh, there is need, back to my screen, there is need. That what, my friends? That the people teach them, pastors, <laughs> the word of God. Just imagine, you go to the countryside and you see a sheep leading its shepherd. What do you think? Something is wrong with that picture. Get back to my screen. There is need that the people teach them the word of God more perfectly before they are capable of doing what, my friends? Instructing others. Number three, objective. A Seventh-day Adventist schools. Number three, prepare who? Prepare men and women to become workers in the various branches of the cause. Hear me. Batter Creek College was co-educational. Men and women. Watch this statement. Volume 5, again, volume 5, my friends. The time is, is 1882. Get to my screen. It says, the primary object of our school, our college, Battle Creek, was to afford young men an opportunity to study for the ministry and to prepare young persons of both sexes to become workers in the various branches of the cause. Let's read red words. What, my friends? Here, our school has been what, my friends? Deficient. 
This was the case in 1882 when Batter Creek College closed. My question is, have our schools become better or worse today? And yet we are calling for revival, reformation. You were calling vain. Objective of Seventh-day Adventist schools. Number four, prepare men for the ministry. Let, come on, let's read that. Prepare men for the ministry. How? In a shorter time than the worldly schools. That means tenure. Now, the worldly schools, how many years must you spend to be certified or equipped, fitted to do ministry? How many... Uh, at least how many years in the world of schools? You, at least four years. Some now, masters, five or six years. Doctorate degree, seven years. As you add up all the, as you have the accrual of years. But what are we told, my friends? In a shorter time. Get to my screen. Volume five again. Get to volume five. Page 27, my friends, today. This evening, the book has been opened, and as Christ said, I am saying, these words are what? These words are what? Luke 4, these words are being fulfilled in your ears. It says, back to my screen, the time has come for me to speak decidedly. The purpose of God in the establishment of our college has been plainly stated. There is an urgent demand for laborers in the gospel field, young men who, who, who design to enter the ministry cannot spend a number of years in obtaining an education. Special advantages should have been given them for a brief yet comprehensive study of the branches most what? Talk to me. Most needed to fit them for their work. Blue words. But I have been shown that this has not been accomplished. Pause right there. Friends, hear me now. Back then, schooling lasted about two years for young men and young women. And then you leave with a trade. Men and women. You become self-supporting. Make sense? Notice now it's four years at least, bachelor's degree. Do you know why? <laughs> if you look at the curriculum in our universities and colleges and the worldly ones, you spend at least two years studying other materials and courses that have nothing to do specifically with your major. And your vocation. You spend two years with the humanities. Is that the truth, my friends? So have we changed? Or have we gotten worse? Get to my screen. It says, uh, the Lord has repeatedly shown that we should not pattern after the popular schools. Ministers of other denominations spend years in obtaining an education. However, our young men must obtain theirs when? In a short time. Listen now, where there is now one minister, there should be 20 whom our college had prepared with God's help to enter the gospel field. Number five, objective of Seventh-day Adventist schools. Friends, we can cry revival, reformation. We can call for today's of fasting and prayer for those two things. But unless, like Josiah, we begin to get to work, my friends, to make serious, practical changes in our schools, in our conferences, churches, publishing work, health work, no revival, no reformation. Number five, it says we must offer manual training to become how? 
self-supporting, and what else? Purpose, aim, to prepare our young men, young women, for the last days. Training manually. It will serve also as a safeguard against sensual indulgence, premature courtship, and marriage. Sister White says, it's because our schools have discarded manual training why there is so much frivolity, fun and games, intramurals, basketball tournament, soccer football tournament, tennis and all these games and movie night, premature dating, premature courting, premature marriage, and, 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 and babies being born out of wedlock to young men. Young women, we're at our colleges. We're in our universities. Keep on crying. Revival and Reformation. You will cry in vain. Listen to what this says, my friend. Volume 5, page 23. It says, to give students a knowledge of books merely is not the purpose of Battery Creek College. It would be well, could there be connected with our college, land for cultivation, and also workshops under the charge of men competent to instruct the students in the various departments of what, talk to me, of physical labor. Much is lost by a neglect to unite physical and mental taxation. The leisure hours of the students are often occupied with frivolous pleasures, which weaken physical, mental, and moral powers under the debasing power of sensual indulgence or the untimely excitement of courtship and marriage. Many students fail to reach that height of mental development which they might otherwise have attained. So now, may I ask you a question? Who will God also blame when young women and young men uh, court prematurely and are babies outside of wedlock? The leaders in our institution. I remember I was in class one day and I asked uh, uh, Dr. Warren, Mervyn Warren, why have we uh, discarded the industries? The manual training. He says, well, I have asked that question for years. And the response I received was that computer science is now manual training. And he smirked. He laughed in the class. Meaning typing. That's now manual training. That's manual labor. Are we in trouble, my friends? Get to my screen. Now, hindrance now. Hindrance to revival. Reformation and the fulfillment of God's ideal for Seventh-day Adventist schools. Number one, administrators and teachers have neglected to study what, my friends? The Bible and Ellen White's writings regarding God's principles of true education. And we just covered the sad account of Professor McLearn. On the screen, I won't reread that. Notice now, volume 5, page 61. It says, professors and teachers have not understood the design of Battle Creek College. We have put in means and thought and labor to make it what God would have it. The will and judgment of those who are almost wholly, completely ignorant of the way in which God has led, us as a people should not have a controlling influence in that college. They, ca they cannot be teachers. Now pause right there. Pause right there. Well, read on. The Lord has repeatedly shown that we should not pattern after who? The popular schools. Pause right there. These men are already Adventists. But because they have rejected the spirit of prophecy, don't know their history, and willingly neglect to study the writings of Sister White and the Bible on true education, back to my screen, red words, they should not 
have a controlling influence in that college. My question is, what would she say then about this? When administrators of present-day SDA schools have hired men and women to teach who are not Seventh-day Adventists. What is the purpose of true education in our schools? To restore God's image in man. So God can present us perfect. It is the work of redemption. Does that make sense? Do the men and the women from Babylon know this last day's message? No. How can they teach it? Since the Bible must be paramount in our schools. If that makes sense, say amen, my friends. Get back to my screen. It says uh, many are for younger ministers and some of more mature experience are neglecting the word of God and also despising the testimonies of his spirit. They do not know what the testimonies contain and do not wish to know. They do not wish to discover and correct their defects of character. Can they become teachers, my friends? So how then can you cry, we want revival, reformation in Seventh-day Adventism when teachers, whether Adventists or not, are professors in our schools and they have rejected Sister White's writings. It's a form of godliness. Get to my screen, volume 8, 306. Many think, foolishly, that in order to obtain an education, it is necessary to study the productions of writers who teach infidelity because their works contain some bright gems of thought. But who was the originator of these gems of thought? It was God and God alone. He is the source of all light. Let's read now red words. Why should you wade? Through what, my friends? The mass of error contained in the works, in the books of pagans and infidels for the sake of a few intellectual truths. When all the truth is at our command, I'm at Ukur, and what textbook were they giving us to study from? Rick Warren's book called A Purpose Driven Church. A book from Richard Holland, Mulholland, whatever his name, or Mr. Foster on contemplative prayer and spiritual formation. Oh, my friends, what more can be said? Hindrance to revival, reformation, and the fulfillment of God's ideal for SDA schools. Number two, let's read that. What it says, my friends, administrators and teachers are whom? Are hirelings. What does that word hireling mean? You are performing a task merely for reward. Listen what this says, volume 5, page 60. Young men, move upon by what, my friends? The Spirit of God to give themselves to the ministry have come to Batter Creek College. For this purpose, let's read now, and have been how? Disappointed. Adequate preparation for this class has not been made. Watch now. And some of the teachers, knowing this, have advised the youth to take other studies and fit themselves for other pursuits. Go build up corporate America. Hirelings! Get back to my screen. If these youth were not firm in their purpose, they were induced. If these youth were not firm in their purpose, they were induced to give up all idea of what, my friends, of studying for the ministry. So what must happen to these hirelings, my friends? Hindrance 
to revival, reformation, and the fulfillment of God's ideal for Seventh-day Adventist schools. Number three, administrators and teachers are lowering biblical standards to gain popularity and patronage. And what is that next sentence? Three words. They are blind. And what? And how does God describe lukewarm Laodiceans? In chapter 3 of Revelation, they think that they are rich, increased with goods, and are in need of nothing, but don't even know. They are what, my friends? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Notice what this says. Volume 5, page 25. If morality... And religion or to live in a school, it must be through a knowledge of God's word. Some may urge, watch, some may urge that if religious teaching is to be made prominent, our school will become unpopular. That those who are not of our faith will not patronize Batter Creek College. What does Sister White say next? Blue words. Let's read. Very well then. Let them go where? To other colleges. Mercy. Where they will find a system of education that suits their taste. Get that straight, my friends. Our school was established not merely to teach the sciences. But for what purpose? The purpose of giving instruction in the great principles of God's word and in the practical duties of everyday life. All right, volume 531, same point. Sister White says, from top, if you lower the standard in Batter Creek College in order to secure popularity, an increase of numbers, and then make this increase a cause of rejoicing. What does Sister White say? Next four words, you show great blindness. Are they blind, my friends? By the way, do you realize most, some of our schools are closing down? AUC, Atlantic Union College, eh, Northeast. Yeah, they're closing. I wonder why. Get back to my screen. If numbers were evidence of success, Satan might claim the preeminence. For in this world, his followers are largely in the majority. It is the degree of moral power pervading the college. That is a test of its prosperity. It is the virtue, intelligence, and piety of the people composing our churches and not their numbers. That should be what, my friends? A source of joy. A source of what? Thankfulness. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So are you blind? No. But do we have blind leaders? And do you know it's summertime? School is about to start again now, right? In August. It's August month. All our schools will begin. And I wonder how many are going to gloat and jump for joy. Look at our enrollment. It has increased. And make that a cause for rejoicing. And that's why our, our provosts and uh, presidents of our colleges can lower the standards. Why? Because the church body, the denomination, is being run as a business. And all these schools are like franchises. A franchise. And it's all about numbers, not standards. If that's clear, say amen. Hindrance to revival, reformation, and the fulfillment of God's ideal for SDA schools. Number four, administrators and teachers. What do they implement, my friends? They introduce 
implement worldliness in Seventh-day Adventist schools. Now, friends, read and weep. Volume 5, page 33, Sister White says, The object of God in bringing the college into existence has been lost sight of. Ministers of the gospel have so far shown their want of wisdom. From above, as to unite a worldly element with the college, they have joined with the enemies of God and the truth in providing what, my friends? Entertainments for the students. Pause right there at Oakwood. Let's go to the skating rink. Lord have mercy upon our souls. Back to my screen. In thus, no, no, no. Let's have a drama as they had these clubs, drama clubs. It's all about fun and games, my friends. Competition. In thus misleading the youth, they have done a work for Satan. That work, with all its results, they must meet again at the bar of God. Those who pursue such a course show that they what, my friends, cannot be trusted. Pause right there, my friends. What is God saying to these presidents and provosts of our colleges? They cannot be trusted. Read on. After the evil work has been done, they may confess their error, but can they as easily gather up the influence they have exerted? What's the answer? No. Will the well done, again I say, will the well done be spoken to those who have been false to their trust? What is the answer, my friends? The answer is no. You could finish that. Pamphlet 117, page 76, paragraph 1. This was written to Batcher Creek leaders in the college, in the church, in what year? 1882, from top, Sister White says, the worst thing. Now, that is superlative. She says, uh, the worst thing that ever happened to Batcher Creek College. Again, context that led this college to close. The worst thing that ever happened to Batcher Creek College was the visit of Mr. Hamill. The teacher of elocution. What is that? What is that? Do your homework. Fascinated with this branch of knowledge, many forgot our position as a peculiar and holy people. They permitted themselves to be led away from God and some souls will be lost in consequence. The fault was not with Mr. Hamill. He worked in accordance with his faith. But those who forgot all higher interests in their zeal to pursue this new study have done no credit to themselves or to the cause they represented. Some made themselves ridiculous. Could this also be attached to dramas and skits? In our schools and now in our churches, the miming, the dancing. It says, though God has reproved their error in mingling with the world, others have done the same thing. And with their spiritual blindness and want of consecration, they continue to do what, my friends? To repeat the same error. Then now, Sister White mentions, Brother Stone, remember him? Brother Stone has not at all times acted in accordance with his faith. I wonder what he did. He has not heeded the testimonies of the Spirit of God, but has opened to Batter Creek School, a door whereby they could, what my friends, connect with the world. Now, there was elocution. What did Brother Stone, an Adventist, do? He was using music as a tool 
to bring in worldliness into Battle Creek College. Question for you. Has our school today, have our schools today become better or worse spiritually? Especially on the point of music. Go to our schools, our churches, watch these choirs. It's a joke, my friends. It's abominable. It's sacrilegious what they sing, how they dress, and how they dance in the pulpits, on the platforms. And if these things called Back to Creek College to close, what is about to happen in the last days here? You could read the rest of that. Let me move on. Look at this headline, July 30th, 2018. Headline says what, my friends? The North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. What are they now doing? Headline. Come on. Sends group of Seventh-day Adventists to Fuller Seminary for training. Now, friends, Fuller Seminary is in Babylon. And where are we sending our pastors? So when they go over there, what would they learn? And when they come back, what would they do? And you're going to sit there call for revival and reformation while these things are continually happening in our schools? You must be joking. Get back to my screen and notice these names. On the left bottom section, these are the men from Babylon that will be the presenters. Men who are teaching evolution, contemplative prayer, spiritual formation, Santos and Andy Crouch, Crouch and these people. Notice a list of Seventh-day Adventist pastors who shall be present. Do you know any one of these men? Timothy Floyd, Steve Case, and that's Andrews, Alan Walsh, Jose Cortez, Marquise Johns, Benji Ferguson, David Eagley, Ken Rogers, <laughs> Jason Bulgin, Hubert Cisneros. How am I? Are we in trouble here, my friends? are in trouble. Listen to what Sister White says now. Volume 5. When those things were happening in Batter Creek College, what did Sister White say? How God viewed it. And since things are worse today, how will God view Andrews, Oakwood, Southern, the North American Division? Alex Bryant, Dan Jackson, the General Conference, oh yes, Ted Wilson, how will God view them and our schools? From top, it says, our college stands today in a position that what? Who, my friends? That God does not approve. I have been shown the dangers that threaten this important institution. If it's responsible men seek to reach the worst standards, if they copy the plans and methods of other colleges, let's read, the frown of God will be upon our school. Did they do so? Yes. Are we doing so today? Yes, my friends. So what is upon our church from God? His frown. His frown. His frown. Get back to my screen. But for one or two years past, there has been an effort to mold our school after other colleges. Let, let's read now. Let's read what it says. When this is done, we can give no encouragement to parents to send their children where? To Battle Creek College. So what is God saying today, my friend? Volume 5, page 14. When teachers and professors shall sacrifice religious principles in order to please a worldly amusement loving class, they should be considered unfaithful to their trust and should be discharged. 
Sister White says, do not send your students, your children to Batter Creek College. So where must they go then? To Babylon? No. What must happen then? You have to establish then some schools. Now, what if you establish them and still have the same leaders who wrecked Battle Creek College to oversee these? What will eventually happen to these new ones? Come on, friends. Come on. Watch this. Manuscript releases, volume 12, page 333, paragraph 1. Now, those who have had years in this same experience know not God, nor Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And should such go forth as God's representatives? No. Why? These men will never give the right mold to other minds. They have not grown up to the full stature of men and women in Christ. They simply have the name of Christians, but are not fitted for the work of God. And never will be until what? They are born again and learn the what, my friends? The A, B, C, in true religion of Jesus Christ. There is only one hope. Ah, oh, my friends, it says there is a little hope in one direction. Remember my phrase? We are prisoners of what? Come on. We are what, my friends? Come on. We are what, my friends? We are prisoners of hope. Back to my screen. It says there is a little hope in one direction. What is God's instruction? Let's read that blue word. Take the young men and women and place them where they will come. As little in contact with our churches as possible. Wait a minute. The first one, take them away from our schools. Now, from our churches. Why? Red words. Why, my friends? So that the low grade of piety, holiness, which is current in this day, shall not leaven their ideas of what it means to be a Christian. If that's clear, you better say amen, my friends. All right. Volume 5, page 25, Sister White says, this is the education. So much needed at the present time. Pause right there. She says, if our schools become worldly, not only don't send your students there and your children. If the church has become worldly, meaning what? Hear me, friends. Don't let men deceive you by saying Pastor Henriquez is saying we must look for a church with pure wheat. No such thing. We look for a pure message Coming from whom? The pastor, the elder. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Because even among Christ's ministry, there was a whom? A tear. The message. The message. But some folks say the wheat and tears must grow together and make that an excuse not to preach a message to prepare wheat. And not to be aggressive to make sure the members in the church are wheat. So wait a minute. Because wheat and tears must go together, we must as uh, leaders sit down and not be aggressive to uplift present truth that everyone become wheat. And we must wait until Sunday law when people are dying daily. And many are going down unprepared. Get back to my screen here. It says, if a worldly influence, okay, yes. Now she says, sell those schools. Do not bring them to those churches. Bring them where present truth is being proclaimed. All right, friends. It says, if a worldly influence is to bear sway in our school, then sell it out to worldlings and let them take the entire control. And those who have invested their means in that institution will establish another school to be conducted, not upon the plan of what, my friends, popular schools, nor according. 
to what? The desires of principal and teachers, but what? Upon the plan which God has specified. Present truth. And then she says, volume 6, 145, though in many respects, our institutions of learning have swung into worldly conformity. Now, did she say if right here? No. They have swung into worldly conformity, though step by step they have advanced toward the world. What does she say next? They are what, my friend? They are prisoners of hope. Does that mean you must sit in a college where the Bible is being suppressed? Where apostasy is prevalent in leadership. Does that statement mean that? No, my friends. Does that statement mean to sit in a church where pastors are in apostasy? The answer is no, as God lives. Unless you want to risk your life, go ahead and go to hell. There's no joke or playing with people's salvation here, friends. All right. Watch carefully as we bring this to a close. So Battle Creek closed for a year or two. Does anyone know why Loma Linda was established? I'm closing right now. But does, does anyone know why Loma Linda was established? Oakwood. Why? It was to do the work Battle Creek had failed to perform. Loma Linda. Question, my friends, on the screen. Question, how does Loma Linda look today? Is Loma Linda worse today than Batter Creek College was in 1881 and 1882? Loma Linda is worse, my friends. So what will God say today? Look at the screen. I don't want to spend much time on this. We covered this. Sodomy in our schools. What about Oakwood? Hmm? Caitlin is coming. And friends, she has come. She has come. What's happening to Oakwood? Mr. Hamill, Sister White says, the worst thing. That happened to Battle Creek College was to bring Mr. Hamill from Babylon into the college. The worst thing, what is happening at Oakwood? Huh? Is God's frown upon us? Okay, my last point is going to be that what we see now, it is a sure sign. Two things, Christ is weeping and probation is about to close. Watch this. Watch this. What's happening on our campuses? All over. I'm going to show you a name. Andrews. And what is the modern battle creek today? Andrews. Watch carefully. Pass that to. Okay. On the right of your screen. Who is that from Andrews? Steve Eagley. Who is going to Fulcrum? Pardon me. Who is going to Fuller's Seminary? Let's, 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 let's rewind. Who is going there, my friends? Did we see Steve Eagley? Let's go back there. Whose name is that on the bottom there? One, two, three, fourth from the bottom up. That's, oh, come on, who is that, my friends? That's David Eagley. Are they, are they connected? Are they? I wonder. Let's come back. I wonder if God's frown is upon us, my friends. Look at this right here. What's happening in Walla Walla University? Who are they inviting there? All right, listen to what Sister White says now. I close right here. Volume 5, 73. Sister White says, I notice now this is Battle Creek College now. She says, I entreat you who have long professed the faith and who still pay outward homage to Christ. Do not deceive your own souls. It is the whole heart that Christ prizes. The loyalty of the soul is alone of value in the sight of God. Here it comes, she says, as she quotes Luke 19. If thou hast known, even thou, 
at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, thou, even thou. Luke 19. Then she says, Christ is at this moment addressing who? You personally. What did Christ say in Luke 19? Verse 40. Verse 41. As he wept over Jerusalem, these words. And she said in 1882, these words are open to you personally today. So what was about to happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church in 1882? Probation was about to close on the church. Because Christ said next, but now they are what? Hid from thine eyes. Behold, the wicked will come. And remember, six years after, a Sunday law was about to be enforced. Are our schools better today or worse? So what is Christ doing based on Luke 19 upon us as a group, upon us individually? He's weeping. So what is your decision tonight? Will you continue to make Christ weep? She says, next, on my screen she says, Whoa, blue words. Woe will be pronounced against thee if thou loiter and linger until the sun of righteousness shall set. The blackness of eternal night will be your portion. Probation was about to close on the leaders and the people in Battle Creek in 1882. How are we today, my friend? Are we better or worse? And we're looking for current events about Trump, the Pope, what's happening in the church, in the schools. Those are your current events also. Probation is about to close. Write this down. I got two paragraphs. Three manuscript releases. Three MR. 198. There's no playing here my friends it says this is watch careful this is a Uriah Smith now you this Uriah Smith that we all talk about and we love so much he was the ringleader these words were also for Uriah Smith these words right here your probation is about to close and one reason why Sister Watt did not quote all of Luke 19, because there was still hope. And praise God, Uriah Smith repented before it was too late, but not the others. May I? L listen to what it says. She says, I had conversation with Elder Smith, more favorable than any previous talk. He seems to be desirous to come to the light. He sees that his course has not been right in some things. And this I know he must see before he could be closely with God. Since the Minneapolis meeting, he has been counteracting my work by his position. Position. The light that God has given me for the church has not been fully received because of Uriah Smith's position. His attitude has said more than words. But after conversing with him freely and showing him what harm he was doing to those who did not want to believe the message or receive the messenger, and the counsel from God, he seemed to see more clearly the position he had occupied. Are there any men with their titles and their positions who stand today like you, Raya Smith, stood? And because of their position, they hinder other people from receiving God's word today? Hmm. He was determined 
to make straight paths for his feet and to take up the stumbling blocks that the lame may not be turned aside out of the way, but rather be healed of their weakness and inefficiency. Elder Smith came in and made a request to have a select number of people present to whom he wished to speak and as far as possible confess where he had been wrong. Why? He made some public remarks against truth and Sister White. He must now confess his fault how? So be careful what to say about God's messengers publicly because if you are going to unite with them in the, in the future, what must you do? Make public confessions of your faults. Listen, at 3 o'clock p.m., the little company assembled in my room. Elder Smith said a few words, then read the letter I had written him after the exercise of my mind Tuesday night. Then Brother Smith, with tears, made a full and free confession of the wrong course he had pursued. He pledged himself as he took my hand that he would stand by me and would never cause me grief of soul again. This was a season pleasant for the Lord to look upon and for us all to contemplate. We hoped Frank Belding would follow Brother Smith, but he did not. Who was Frank Belding? Do you know Frank Belding has songs in your hymnal? That's your homework also. F.E. Belding. And uh, the history says, I believe, I believe he was Sister White's nephew. Your own foe shall be found where? Elder Smith came in and made a request. It says, it says here, it says, watch carefully now. Let me start right here. He says, we, Sister White now says, we respect Brother Smith. Our confidence in him is restored. We feel more closely united with him in Jesus Christ. She said from that day, every sermon Elder Smith preached in the next month or two, before he preached, he stood up and he publicly confessed again his faults, how he warred against the message, warred against A.T. Jones, warred against E.J. Wagner, warred against God through Ellen White. He did this a number of times, showing his true remorse. To me, he was brought back like a Peter. And we have to be very careful what we say about others, especially those who are presenting present truth. On whose side will you stand tonight? Do you truly want revival and reformation? Do you truly want God to have a group of people prepared for these last days. Do you want to be in that number? Knee with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words tonight. And we pray the effect of these words will not lose their potency upon our minds. Save us, we pray. Save your church. Save the schools. Be with the leaders and convert them and convert us as well. Save us and we thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.